Well, tonight we are in the book of 1 Corinthians again, the 15th chapter. If you would look there, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We read beginning with verse 1. We will read down to verse 11. And the Word of our God says this, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve, then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, as we've sung earlier tonight, we, we wish that we had greater powers of expression than we do. And yet we ask you to grant your gracious assistance so that we can declo declare your glory in this place tonight. We pray, Lord, that you would open our understanding, that you would strengthen our ability to grasp the things that we've read. That you would be at work not only in the communication of your truth, but in the reception of your truth, so that when we leave here tonight, we can truly say that we have known what it is to encounter you, the living God, on the pages of Scripture. Lord, I pray that, that we would learn principles that would not just enter our minds or a notebook, but that we would learn tonight things that we will carry out of this place and, and walk in. Lord, we pray for anyone in our midst who doesn't know you, our desires for their salvation. We pray for your people that we would be encouraged, washed, cleansed, corrected, instructed, strengthened, everything that you know that we need. I pray especially, Lord, for brothers and sisters who are going through times of trial right now. Lord, I know those can be times that are weary, uh, wearying for them, and I just pray that you would really grant encouragement. We love you. We thank you for your love for us, your faithfulness to us, your kindness to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Corinthian church had many problems. We know that. That's not new news to us. At the root of those problems were a few basic sources. Ultimately, of course, you could say there was one source. And that is they were not walking in step with Christ. They were not walking in step with the truth. But as you read this letter, as you read 1 Corinthians, we can be a little more specific than that. As we, as we look at their problems, which were many, there are at least three things that stand out as a root source, a root cause for why they were experiencing all of these problems. First of all, we can say they were having trouble because they were at odds with apostolic authority. Through the influence of false teachers, through the influence of their own spiritual pride, through the influence of their love for the world, they found themselves at odds with the Apostle Paul. 
And evidence of that is runs all throughout this letter. In fact, when Paul wrote what he did concerning the place of women in the public worship setting, uh, we saw last time in chapter 14, I mean, he expects that he's going to have objections to what he's taught. He expects there's going to be opposition. This is why he says, for example, in verse 34, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they're not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there's anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or, notice how he anticipates trouble. He says, or, was it from you that the word of God came? Or are you the only ones it has reached? If anyone thinks that he's a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not what? Recognized. If there's anyone there who's not going to submit to what I'm saying, you don't give them the floor. So my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, etc. So what does he expect? What do you sense that he's expecting in those verses? He expects opposition. And this runs throughout the letter. So when you're not listening to the one whom the Lord has sent to instruct you, correct you, teach you, guide you, when you won't listen to him, you're not going to do well and... and and through these influences we've talked about, they had become desensitized to the ministry of the Apostle Paul. They just were not listening to him. This gets to a second source for their problems. They were having trouble, this goes hand in hand, because they were at odds with apostolic doctrine. The real issue is never personalities, is it? I mean, they were having trouble with the Apostle Paul, but what they were really having trouble with was what he was teaching. They had their own ideas, they had their own ways, they had their own way of thinking, and they didn't like necessarily what he was saying. And so what was really at issue was what he was teaching, and they found themselves, as a result of their alienation from him, listening to, receiving bad doctrine, and embracing it, adopting it. One clear example is right here in chapter 15. When you get down to verse 12, notice what it says. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? I mean, there was a significant group in Corinth that had come to accept and to say that there would be no future bodily resurrection of the saints. In fact, that's what this entire chapter's main theme has to do with, resurrection. The reason why is because, verse 12, there were some who were saying there will be no resurrection from the dead. Where did they get that from? Well, when we get down to verse 12, and we won't tonight, we'll talk more about that. But it was not uncommon at all in Greek philosophy for there to be this sort of dualism, this separation between the spiritual and the physical, and the spiritual is good and the physical is not really that important. And so they would scoff at the idea of physical resurrection. They were being influenced by their culture. They were being influenced by false teachers as well. So they're at odds with the Apostle Paul. They're at odds with apostolic doctrine. There's a third factor that I just mentioned. They were, they were in trouble because they were being influenced by their world. Influenced by their culture. Influenced by their past. Influenced by their fleshly desires. When you're not listening to the Apostle and you're not listening to apostolic doctrine, then who are you listening to? And so the world was showing up in the Corinthian church. One of the real clear uh, examples of this is the whole discussion of spiritual in the letter in, the, in 1 Corinthians. Again, notice in chapter 14, verse 37, if anyone thinks that he's a prophet or spiritual, pneumatikos is the word, and you find it used this way in 1 Corinthians, spiritual. They had this concept of being spiritual that obviously Paul didn't agree with. That's why he's correcting them. But where did they get their ideas of what it means to be spiritual? Where were they getting it from? Not from the truth, not from the Word of God. So they're getting it somewhere else, being influenced by their culture, their world, the philosophies of men. So you have all these problems, but there are some root causes. What does Paul do to address it? Well, he does two things. First of all, he 
insists on his authority with them. He refuses to be disregarded. He writes these letters. He goes and visits them. Uh, when you read the two letters together, First and Second Corinthians, even in the second letter where he's rejoicing over their repentance, they're still concerned. And there's still even the threat that if things don't get straightened out, he'll have to come in a spirit of discipline. He defends his apostleship. Uh, he does that even here in chapter 15, in verse 8, when he says, Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me from the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Why does he have to say things like that? Because obviously he's being disrespected, disregarded. His apostleship in terms of being compared to the others is being questioned. And he has to defend himself. This is not just the Apostle Paul. He says basically the same thing to Timothy in the pastoral epistles when he says, Let no one disregard you. In another place he says, Let no one despise you for your youth. That is, you have to recognize that you've been called by God to carry out a ministry... And you're going to give an account to God one day so that, so that your authority is not determined by the people's response to you if you're doing the right thing. Your authority is determined by God's calling upon your life and the responsibility He's entrusted to you. And even when people disregard you, you must stand for what is true and right. That's what He's going to do and that's what He does in this letter. So he insists on this authority, but there's something else he does hand in hand with that. He insists on the truth that was given to him to proclaim. What does he do in this letter? He just keeps telling them the truth. And that's what he does right here in chapter 15. I said to you the central issue in this chapter is resurrection. The reason why it's the central issue is because in the Corinthian church some were teaching... That even though Jesus was raised from the dead bodily, at least we hope and trust they still believed that, they were denying that believers would be raised from the dead bodily. And he's going to show the outlandish nature of that kind of thinking, how inconsistent that is with, and here's the key, with the gospel. So what he does on his way to dealing with the subject of resurrection is he basically says in the first 11 verses, let's do a gospel review. I want to show you that you've departed, you've departed from the truth because you've departed from the most basic, fundamental, essential, foundational truths, that is, you have departed from the gospel. When you adopt such a thought, you've, you've departed, you've removed yourself from what is the true gospel. So that really in verses 1 through 11, though he's heading somewhere specific, the subject of resurrection, there's a great lesson here about the importance of the gospel. Or we could even talk about it this way, the gospel as, as a preservative force. That the gospel not only is there at the beginning of our Christian experience, you know, we're delivered, we come to faith in Christ through the preaching of the gospel, but then the gospel remains there for us throughout the rest of our time on this earth, and it serves as the pathway in which we safely walk. It serves as the preservative that keeps us spiritually healthy. It keeps us like a guardian that keeps us out of error. The way you end up in stuff you shouldn't be in is you depart from the gospel. And the way you stay straight and healthy is you remain in the gospel. That's what we have in verses 1 through 11, the importance of the gospel. So tonight I want us to think about that. I want you to get your brain already in that vein, thinking about the importance of the gospel. And I want to point out from verses 1 through 11, really mostly verses 1 through 2, I want to point out six things he tells us here concerning the gospel. The first thing is this. The gospel can be forgotten. The gospel can be forgotten by people who know it. By people who believe it. By people who have trusted in Christ through that message. 
You notice how he begins verse 1. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, by which you're being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Literally, he says, I would make known to you. You know it, but I need to reacquaint you with it. You know it, but I need to reintroduce it to you. He, he, he definitely treats them as people who are saved, doesn't he? He refers to them as brothers. And then he talks about, we'll get to this in a moment, but he talks about their standing in the gospel and that they're being saved by the gospel. So he's not denying that these people are born again. Now they know the gospel, but why does he have to remind them of it? Why does he have to make it known to them again? Why does he have to reintroduce it to them? Because it's possible for saved people to, to, to forget the most fundamental, essential elements of truth. In fact, I don't think it's too strong to say this is how we always go astray. At some point, if we're not doing well, you can trace it back to some basic forgetfulness regarding the gospel. These people in Corinth thought that they had advanced when in fact they had digressed. They thought they had some kind of greater knowledge. Uh, beloved, do you understand Gnosticism in an official, organized, sort of identifiable form really didn't exist until the second century. But there's always been a kind of Gnosticism in the world. Well, you know what Gnosticism refers to, right? Knowledge, gnosis, knowledge. And the idea is there's some secret kind of knowledge. There's some superior kind of knowledge. There's some special kind of knowledge only for the reserved few. And though you have the Bible and though you have God's revelation and though it has its good things to offer to you, you know what? There's really something more out there. There's really something a little bit beyond these basic, simplistic things that you find in the gospel. And, it, and, and Gnosticism can have so many different forms. You can have sort of a scientific Gnosticism. You know, I know what the Bible says about creation, but now we have all this science. And so if you want to be simplistic and believe the biblical account of creation, you can. But, you know, if you really want knowledge, you're going to trust what we're telling you, what we're discovering through our observations and discoveries. You can have this in the, in the, in the realm of, of um, people's behaviors, and we're going to explain how they behave and why they behave. We know what the Bible says about sin and repentance, but that's way too simplistic. People don't behave the way they do because of sin. There's got to be some other reason for it. So we'll tell you what the real reason for it is. Don't be so simple as to believe the real need is for them just to repent of sin. And so there's, there's all kinds of different Gnosticism, mystical, religious, spiritual kinds of Gnosticism as well. Yeah, you have the Bible, but have you had this experience? And if you have this experience, it will catapult you spiritually and it's something beyond what you have in just you know, simple Christianity and believing the Word of God. But you mark this down. When you move away from the gospel, you're never moving forward. You're always moving backwards. And this is why he has to take them back to the beginning. Because the gospel can be forgotten. The second thing we notice in verses 1 and 2 is the gospel has to be heard. Has to be proclaimed. Has to be heard in order for people to benefit from it. Verse 1, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you. He emphasizes this. In fact, he emphasizes it more than once in verse 2, the word I preached to you. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, I declared to you. To know Christ, to know the true God, someone had to proclaim the gospel to us. In the case of the Corinthian church, that preacher was the apostle Paul. Why does he emphasize, I preached it to you? Because now their pride had cut them off from the very person God had used to give them spiritual life. God had brought Paul. God had brought his preaching. And through the preaching of Paul, they heard the gospel. And through the gospel, they came to, to the Lord God. And, and now they weren't listening to him. 
They needed to hear the gospel again. It needed to be preached to them again. And guess what? He was God's chosen instrument to re-preach the gospel to them all over again. But they would not benefit from it if they would not listen to him. He emphasized this earlier in the letter, 1 Corinthians 4.15. He says this, For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Again, beloved, think with the word of God, all right? Why would a man, a godly man, say such a thing? You have countless guides in Christ, but you don't have many fathers. And I became your father. I brought the gospel to you right here in our text. I preached it to you. I declared it to you. Why is Paul saying that? Because, again, they're at odds with apostolic authority. They're not listening to the apostle. Let me ask you tonight, what happens to a person's life when they feel that they have grown beyond the need to be taught? What happens to your life when no one can teach you anymore? What happens to your life when you don't listen anymore? When no one can correct you, when no one can guide you, when no one can teach you because you already know? Where are you at when that's the case? So the gospel can be forgotten, and the reason why the gospel can be forgotten is because we can begin to turn a deaf ear to the people God has ordained to teach us. Now the gospel has to be heard if we're going to benefit from it. Let's get to a third thing we see. The gospel has to be received. I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received. You received it. What does that mean, to receive the gospel? It means you believe it. It means that you trust God because you know that the good news you've heard is from Him. It means you have faith and confidence in the Word of God. It means that you rest in the Word of God. It means that you turn away in your own mind, in your own heart. You turn away from any other way that would disagree with His Word. Any other way that you've ever imagined, any other way that the culture would ever suggest and give credence to. Your confidence, your faithfulness, your loyalty, your heart, your mind trusts in what God has said in the gospel. You believe it. And think about how we all began in believing, receiving the gospel. What kind of a place is this when you receive the gospel? Well, it's a place of humility, isn't it? No one receives the gospel if they haven't been humbled. No one receives the gospel in pride. So to receive the gospel means that my heart has been humbled before the Lord. I know who He is, and I know who I am, and I know that I must hear Him. Humility. It's a place of gratefulness. When we first received the gospel, we saw God as holy, we saw ourselves as sinners, and the news that holy God was willing to be gracious and kind and forgiving to us was astounding to us. We were a thankful, grateful people when the gospel first came to us. And so to receive the gospel in an ongoing way means we remain in that place not only of humility, but of thankfulness and gratefulness. It's a place of simplicity. You may have been a really wise guy when the Lord saved you. But you weren't a wise guy in your eyes when the Lord saved you, were you? I mean, up to that point, you may have thought of yourself as very bright and very sharp, and you know, no one could, any, could really tell you anything, and you had all the answers. But the day you received the gospel, the day you received Jesus because you believe God's good news concerning him, all your fancy arguments flew out the window. And like a little child, which, by the way, is how you enter the kingdom, like a little child, you simply believed what God said. Can I ask you tonight, have you lost that simplicity? Do you realize this is how we must live every day in simple dependence upon the Word of God? Simple dependence. 
Man does not live by what? Bread alone. That's basic stuff, isn't it, bread? Just basic stuff. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's a simple life, isn't it? What do you say, God? What does your word say? So to receive the gospel is a place of humility. It's a place of gratefulness. It's a place of simplicity. In a word, it is a place of faith. Confidence in God and His Word. Well, they had past tense. He's taking them back to their past because He's reminding them, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you. It hasn't changed. Same message. The gospel that, that you heard then, the gospel that you received. That is the fourth thing He tells us. The gospel can be forgotten. The gospel must be heard. The gospel has to be received. Fourth, the gospel when it's believed, results in a gracious position. When you believe the gospel, when you receive the gospel, the result is now you have a new standing. You stand in the gospel. He says, verse 1, which you received in which presently, right now, you stand. You stand right now in the gospel. How dare you depart from it when it's your life? How dare you depart from it when it's your very standing before God? To say they stand in the gospel, even when, as we'll see in a few verses, they're in danger of denying the gospel is to acknowledge, is to point out the fact that God's work in the believer is powerful and it's permanent. If these people are really saved, they stand in the gospel and they will always stand in the gospel. Because when they believed the gospel, they now had a... they were given by God's grace a standing in His grace. They have a new position. It's how we stand before the Lord. It's how we're accepted by God. It's in Christ. Romans 5, 1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him, we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. You see? We've been established in something. Established in the gospel. Established in the grace of God. He goes on to say, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now we just wait to behold the glory of the one who's been so gracious to us. The book of Jude, the first verse, it says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Where are we kept? We're kept in grace. Or we could say it this way, we are kept in the gospel. Remember that, we're kept in the gospel because if you depart from the gospel, what is finally proven is that you were never in the gospel. So, you, you, listen, if you stand in the gospel, that means you've really received it. If you don't remain in it, you didn't lose it, you never really received it, you never really had it. We'll see that in a moment. So the gospel can be forgotten. Even believers, even brothers, need to be taken back to those foundational, essential truths. The gospel then must be preached. It must be preached to believers. He's re-preaching it to believers right here, which means you've got to listen. You've got to be taught. You've got to be, have an open heart to those whom God has ordained to teach you. The gospel must be received, believed, trusted in. This is where your confidence is. Because there's a whole world of Gnosticism out there that will tell you there's something more than the simple gospel that's been delivered to you. Now you've got to believe the gospel, receive the gospel. And if you've received it, you stand in it. This is your life. This is your position before God. Which gets to the fifth thing we see, and that is the gospel is how the believer is being saved. It's how we are saved, finished work, 
talking about salvation in the terms of justification, declared right with God. We have already been saved, finished work through believing the gospel message, trusting in Christ. But listen, believer, it is how you are being saved. Isn't that what he says? Verse 2, and by which, this gospel, by which you are being saved right now. Ongoing, progressive. What gospel, Paul? Verse 1, the gospel I preach to you. Which gospel, Paul? Into verse 2, the word I preach to you. It's the same message. The message that was there at the beginning is the message you need today, is the message you need tomorrow, is the message you need for the rest of your life until you're glorified. You never depart from it. You never grow beyond it. Now there's great depth in the gospel. We know that. It's inexhaustible. Take any doctrinal subject that's contained in what we're even looking at tonight. You can take it as deep as you want to go and as wide as you want to go. That's the nature of God's revelation. But when you look at what it actually is in terms of its fundamental nature and its wholeness, you never leave it. Never go beyond it. The gospel is how the believer is sanctified. Here's what that means practically. It means that I have to return to the gospel every day. How am I going to grow in my walk with God? I go to the gospel. I live in the gospel every day. How did you begin this morning? How did, how did your prayer time begin? How were your thoughts as you began this day? Every day we need to realize the truth about Jesus and the truth about us, right? I mean, every day I realize something. I love the one who loved me first and who gave himself for me. God is holy, and in Adam I was a wretched sinner deserving of the wrath of God. And before I was ever born, this awesome, unbelievable, holy, infinite God chose me for salvation. And sent His only begotten Son into the world to save His people from their sins. He lived a sinless life. He died on a tree as a substitute for me and all those who will trust in Him. He was raised from the dead bodily. He's ascended into heaven so that now He intercedes for me at the right hand of the Father. When I get up this morning, I have access to the Father because of my Savior. And He dwells in me this day in the person of the Holy Spirit. Christ in me, the hope of glory. So that as I commune with God, He's not a million miles away, He's here. And He walks with me, and He communes with me, and He corrects me, and He teaches me. He is my resident truth teacher. And when I don't even know how to pray, so if I get up this morning and I'm struggling in prayer, if I don't even know how to pray as I ought, He intercedes for me, Christ in me in the person of the Spirit of God. He intercedes for me with groanings that can't be uttered. He is arranging my day so that there are no accidents in my life. Everything that happened today was for my ultimate good and God's glory. And all of my life is a schoolhouse. Because through it all, God is teaching me and knocking off the rough edges and exposing my sin and forming the character of His Son in my life. And I'll never be any wiser than that. And I'll never be any stronger than that. And I'll never be any more impressive than that. Because God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And the weak things to confound the strong. And the things that are not to confound the things that are. You see, that's the what? The gospel. And we lived that today. And we live that every day. That's how we grow. That's how we're sanctified. So that today I realize my need to be taught. I realize the absolute logical necessity of my humility. You do understand pride is logically insane. 
Who am I to be proud? Humility is logically sound. If I know who God is, and if I know who I am, and if I know what real strength and wisdom I possess in myself, there's no reason for pride. Galatians 2.19 says this, Paul writing, for, th- for through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. I mean, when Christ died on the cross, so did I. I died when he died. When he was raised, I was raised. He goes on to say this, It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, this life, right here in this world, year 2011, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's how Paul lived his life. That's how we live our lives. The gospel. It can be forgotten in our advancement, in our Gnosticism. We move away from it. We're not going forward, we're going backwards. We've got to hear it. We've got to receive it. We have our standing in it. It's how we're being saved. Notice the last thing we see here. There's something else we can say about the gospel. It is the proving ground for believers. The gospel doesn't just save us. It demonstrates our salvation. It proves us. It demonstrates God's work in us. Notice what he says. And by which you are being saved. Next word. If. If you hold fast, which is to say, if you hold on to it, if you're not moved away from it, if you don't trade it for something else, if you don't exchange it for the kind of nonsense you're in danger of exchanging it for, verse 12, if you hold fast to it, this is all true of you, unless you believed in vain. Paul treats them as believers. Paul expresses his confidence that they are believers. But Paul is also aware of the reality of vain belief. What is vain belief? It's a kind of belief that's empty. That's a sham. Not real. Not saving. Not saving faith. You could call it temporary faith. You could call it demonic faith. Hypocritical faith. But it's not saving faith. And the way you know that your faith in the gospel is real is that you stay in the gospel. You don't let go of the message he preached, which is the same message we have believed and is in the scriptures. You hold on to it. And all around you will be temptations not to hold on to it. <clears throat> the kind of Gnosticism that we've talked about tonight, as I've already said, it didn't stop in the first century. It's still going on. I'll never forget years ago when I was serving as youth pastor at a church in Austin. There were a couple of um, parents, parent couples. They had students in the ministry that I, that I led and served in. And they used to love to listen to John MacArthur, and they were really into John's ministry. And so we would get together, and we would just talk about the Bible and talk about things like that. And I'll never forget when all of a sudden I began to see some negative signs in one of, one of these parent couples. And they grew more and more distant, and they began to ask some kind of odd questions. And then one night, I'll never forget, they, they brought a box full of John MacArthur tapes and books, things of that nature, and they gave it to me. They gave it to me because they didn't want it anymore. They didn't want it anymore because they had just come into, through a few months, they had been exposed to the teaching ministry of a guy named Bob George. If you know anything about Bob George, then you know it's, it's, a, it's a perversion of grace. And I'll never forget how they described it to me when they said, take this, 
They said this, we are now, and this was their, their, their words, we are now happy heretics. Meaning, not that they really believed they were heretics, but they thought that I believed, and I did, that they were buying into heresy. Where that couple ever ended up finally, I don't know. But here's what I do know. When they made that decision that day, it was not because they didn't know the biblical gospel intellectually. It's not because they had never heard it. It's not because they didn't understand the difference between a message that says that Jesus is Lord versus a message that says that you can actually trust in Jesus and there be no fruit in your life, no desire for Him. Sin doesn't really matter. They understood the difference between those two things very clearly. They just simply chose to trade in what they had been taught for something else. And when you trade in the biblical gospel for anything else, you call into question, serious question, whether you have ever been in the gospel at all. He says, if you hold fast the word that I preached to you unless you believed in vain. It's amazing, isn't it, what the Bible does with people who walk away from Jesus. The Bible doesn't attribute it to social factors, emotional factors, health factors, any of a slew of the slew of reasons people try to look for to explain why someone departs from Jesus. The Bible always places it squarely at the feet of a person's spiritual condition. Have you believed in vain? Now, we don't have time tonight. We're going to get into it next time, but just real briefly, I don't want us to leave tonight without asking, what is the gospel message? What is this basic, fundamental, essential message that Paul preached and that they believed? Well, you see it in verses 2 through 11. Let's just read it, and I'm going to point out very quickly six things about it. I mean, just in rapid-fire fashion. Verse 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. What does he declare there? One, in the Gospel you have a divine person. You notice he uses the word Christ as a name here, doesn't he? That Christ died. Christ died. What is he emphasizing? That Jesus, the one who died, is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is God in human flesh. So you have a divine person. Second, you have a substitutionary death in the gospel. He died, this Christ died, for our sins. His death was not just some moral example, just some expression of the love of God. No, he was dying in our place for our sins. And he's writing that to believers. Third, he died according to the plan of God. All of this was in accordance, verse 3, with the Scriptures. Which is to say, this is a plan expressed in the Old Testament. You rightly interpret Jesus in light of the Old Testament teaching with the New Testament revelation of his person, who he is. So he died according to the plan of God. Fourth, he was buried, which is to say he died bodily, and he was raised bodily. Verse 4, he was buried, that he was raised, get this, on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. So you also believe he was raised according to the plan of God and his own prophetic announcement. Jesus said, tear down this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. If he wasn't raised on the third day, then he was a false prophet. Finally, the gospel declares that all of this is real and it has been proven by post-resurrection appearances. One very quick note, I'll deal with this a little bit next time as well. Notice on verse 6, Paul emphasizes he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. You know, there's never been, you just don't have mass hallucination, do you? I mean, 500 people hallucinate at the same time, in the same place. But he doesn't even stop with those 500. 
He also appeared to Cephas, James, the other apostles. Finally, we'll deal with this next time, but like one, like an, an aborted child is what the word means. Untimely born. Paul, why would he use that way to describe himself? We'll talk about that next time. So that you can't deny any of those things and be a true believer. You deny the true person of Jesus, the God-man, you're not a true believer. You deny the true purpose of his life, which was expressed in his death, the true nature of his death, you get that wrong, you're not a real believer. You deny the bodily death of Jesus and the bodily resurrection of Jesus, you don't have the gospel. You deny that all of this was foretold and perfectly fulfilled, you've missed the message. You deny that his resurrection was real, that he demonstrated it with post-resurrection appearances. You don't understand Jesus. So that these truths don't just represent your beginning and your course, but they go on proving that you're really in it, that you've really received it, because you don't let go of it. You continue in it. The importance of the gospel as a preservative to keep us healthy and safe. And it's actually God who's doing this, keeping us in the truth. Praise Him for His gracious work in our lives. Let's bow together for prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for these wondrous things that we would have never thought of ourselves, not the inventions of men, but your revelation to us. Thank you for your good news. I pray, Lord, that we would never become proud and trust, lean on our own understanding in any way but that we would just humbly, gratefully, simply, in a childlike fashion, go on believing our Father, trusting the things you have revealed to be true. And we know, Lord, in that way we are kept safe and sound. I pray that we would be a people who live our lives every day reminding ourselves of this message that we know, fellowshipping with you around the truths, that you have not only revealed to us, but brought to bear upon our lives in a way that has made us your children. We thank you and praise you for who you are and what you've done in our case. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. We'll be dismissed with